Some strange results have come up in about the last 20, 30 years, particularly in astronomy and also in quantum physics, which suggests that the universe actually may have a purpose, and some physicists are now suggesting it does have a purpose. And this has come out of some findings ab about the atomic, some of the fundamental numbers in atomic physics. During the past 40 years, scientists have determined the relative strengths of each of these primary laws and forces. These strengths are so critically balanced, they are often described as being finely tuned. These are numbers like the mass, the weight of an electron, the weight of a quark, the strength of gravity, the strength of the electromagnetic field, about 20 numbers that describe those and other parameters, features of our world, but nobody knows why it is that those numbers have the particular values that they do. Now, you could easily say, yeah, who really cares? You change the mass of the electron by a little bit more, a little bit less, does it really matter? And the answer is it does. See, it turns out that if you imagine that we had 20 dials right here, and we could fiddle with those 20 numbers at will, even a small change to the values of the known values of those numbers would cause the world as we know it to disappear. Because it turns out, and this is a very surprising, unexpected discovery, that the laws of physics, the basic given fabric of the world, had to be very specific, very finely tuned, as we sometimes say, for the possibility of carbon-based life appearing at all. For example, the strengths of the other forces are all important, the masses of the various subatomic particles. Now, this is one of a long list of properties in underlying physics that seem to be prerequisites for a universe with life. If all of these things were even a little bit different, uh, then life uh, certainly life as we know it could not exist. It's a very surprising uh, conclusion, uh, but it's, tr it's true and all scientists would acknowledge that's the case. Bernard Carr is a cosmologist and studies how the laws of physics operate in the universe. He says that the laws of nature are so finely tuned to enable complex life to exist that it is extremely unlikely that this could have happened by chance. Such fine-tuning, Carr believes, at least raises the possibility of a tuner. This is a diagram, it's called the pyramid of complexity, and what we've got here, we've got the different levels of structure in the universe, and at the bottom we've got the things like quarks that make up the atoms, and the atoms build up to make molecules, the molecules build up to make living cells, the cells make organisms, and eventually we end up with brains and consciousness. It's rather hard to, to you know, estimate what the probability is, but it was clearly very, very unlikely that those coincident, those fine tunings which allowed this pyramid of complexity to arise would be there. A very simple and central example is the question of where does carbon come from? The very early universe doesn't make any carbon. It, oh, it's very simple, it only makes simple things. Hydrogen and helium, and they're pretty boring in terms of chemistry. Now, where does carbon come from? There's only one place in the whole universe where carbon is made, and it's in the interior nuclear furnaces of the stars. We are people of stardust, made of the ashes of dead stars. And it turns out that the process by which the carbon is made inside the stars is an extraordinarily delicate process. In fact, it looked at first sight as though it couldn't happen at all. It's only possible because there's a very large enhancement effect called a resonance in the tray, which makes it go much quicker than we might have expected. And that resonance is there because the laws of nuclear physics take a very specific form. If they were a little bit different, either there would be no resonance or it would be in the wrong place at the wrong energy. That's a very striking example of how finely tuned the universe has to be for us to be inhabitants of it. The fine tunings, how fine, how fine tuned are they? Most of them are 1% sort of things. In other words, if a thing is 1% uh, different, uh, everything is bad. And a physicist could say, maybe those are just luck. On the other hand, this cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea, that something is tuned to 120 decimal places just by accident. That's the most extreme example of fine-tuning. No force in the history of cosmology has ever been discovered to be that finely tuned. The cosmological constant needs to be set to one part in a trillion, 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 
Otherwise the universe would be so drastically different that it would be impossible for us to evolve. That the cosmological constant arrived at such a tiny value by chance seemed to be out of the question. Uh, for example, if we go back to say one second after the Big Bang, uh, at that point the expansion rate and the mass density have to have been adjusted to each other just right uh, so that the universe is just at this critical point. Uh, if the universe at that point were expanding just one part in the 15th decimal place faster, the universe would have flown apart without galaxies ever having had a chance to form. On the other hand, if the expansion rate were just a little slower than what we think by one change, change of one in the 15th decimal place, uh, then the universe uh, would in fact have expanded to a maximum size and collapsed. We would never have even reached the time in the universe at which we're living. Ce sont des chiffres, des données chiffrées, avec un zéro, une virgule, et puis parfois des dizaines de décimales derrière la virgule. Eh bien, si on changeait simplement une seule de ces décimales sur une seule de ces 20 constantes, l'univers ne pourrait pas apparaître. Eh bien, ça, ça signifie que le hasard n'a aucun rôle à jouer à l'origine de l'univers. How did this come about, this, this rather terrific luck of course, one of the first explanations that comes to mind is that there was a tuner or a creator, or if you like, God. And obviously for people of a theological disposition, the idea that the fine-tuning is evidence of God, of course, is wonderful. we look at the details of nature, uh, one thing stands out. This is the order, the patterns, the symmetry that surround us. You can see it in a flower, or a snowflake, or even a seashell. What we are seeing is intelligent design, which might be described as God's fingerprints upon nature. One of the more fascinating math relationships was first described back in medieval times, eight centuries ago. The scholar's name was Leonardo Fibonacci, an outstanding Italian mathematician. He excelled in many areas, and one in particular. He generated a long list of numbers by, in each case, adding together the two previous numbers. You can begin with a two and a three. You add them together and you get five. Now add three and five to get eight. Then add five and eight to get 13. The Fibonacci sequence keeps going like this. Two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on. What Fibonacci realized was that this elegant list of numbers describes many items to be found in nature. That there is a mathematically precise structure to the universe and everything in it. One everyday example of this precision can be found in the plants. Many plants, including elm trees, grow their leaves, twigs and branches placed exactly halfway around the stem from each other. Next in the series are plants like the beech tree, with leaves placed one third of the way around the stem from the previous leaves. Third in the series are the plants like the oak with leaves placed at every two-fifths of a turn. The holly plant is the next at three-eighths, while the larch trees are the next at five-thirteenths. And the sequence goes on and on. Notice the number sequence of these fractions. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and so on. Each number is the sum of the two numbers which came just before it in the sequence. This particular mathematical pattern is called the Fibonacci series. Take for example the sunflower. The display of its florets are in perfect spirals of 55, 34 and 21. The sequence of Fibonacci, the sequence of Fibonacci, the sequence of Fibonacci. The sequence The fruitlets of the pineapple create the same spiral based on the sequence. The pine cone does the same. As currents move through the ocean and the tide rolls onto the shore, the waves that bring in the tide curve into a spiral that can be mathematically diagrammed onto a plot at the points 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and 55. 
buds on trees, sand dollars, starfish, petals on flowers are formed with this exact same blueprint. This blueprint can be seen around us on a small scale every day, but the greatest example of all is directly above our heads. At an average of 100,000 light years across, even the spiral of the galaxies above us are formed with the exact design. With the exact design. With the exact design. This sequence, our blueprint, appears to be the trademark of a designer, a proof of a creator. Also known as the golden mean, the divine proportion is a mathematical formulation exhibited in everything from the double helix of DNA. The DNA molecule, the code for life, is made up of two intertwining spirals. We find the 0.618 ratio between the helix's width and cycle length to the form of the human body itself. Do something like measure the distance from the floor to your navel and then from your navel to your head. If you're well proportioned, the ratio should be 1 to 1.618, and that ratio is seen all over the beautiful body. People started noticing it, artists noticed it, the width of the in a beautiful face, for example. Yeah. Not in any face, but it had to be beautiful. If a face was beautiful, the width of the mouth was exactly 1.618 times the width of the nose. Right. If the face wasn't beautiful, that wasn't the case. Dentists, yeah. in their dental work, noticed that the upper front tooth was 1.618 times as wide as the next, next tooth over, the lateral incisor. Oh. So the central incisor was 1.618 times the width of the lateral incisor, the next tooth over. Wonderful. Give me some more uh, the, your fingers, the, um, the Your fingers are each called phalanges, yeah. and each bone of the finger is called a phalanx. And the phalanx that's most the closest to your knuckle here is 1.618 times the, uh, the phalanx that's in the middle, and that's 1.618 times the length of the phalanx at the end, which is your fingernail. So that was kind of amazing. This number would come up over and over again. Then we find the Fibonacci ratio in heart muscles, in bronchial tube branch, even in the electrical potential of neurons, and as Roger Penrose pointed out, even in the arrangement of the brain's microtubules. As we scan our universe from the tiny flower to the awe-inspiring galaxy, we see the fingerprint of God. We see the fingerprint of God. We see the fingerprint of God. As we're going to show in this broadcast today, that there is no doubt at all anymore that the science of intelligent design absolutely crushes any competition, absolutely crushes any other theory about the nature of the universe that we live in. It, it's over. There is simply no contest. The preeminent theory, model, science of reality from this point forward I declare on this show is the science of intelligent design the science of intelligent design and the absolute proof <laughs> I mean absolute I'm using a strong word there proof is going to be given to you today in just a minute here <laughs> I just can't even believe it to be honest Discoveries like what I'm about to discuss to you just never cease to amaze me. For many reasons, that it's all covered, nobody knows, it's covered up. And, well, since I was taught growing up that the world was, was basically a random universe, to just to find out such hardcore, distinct verification that that's a lie just never ceases to amaze me so here's the information so here's the information I'm reading from the abstract of an article this is the first of many academic articles I'm going to be showing discussing with you here today and these aren't just some academic journals. These are 
you go ask your university professor what the most prestigious journal, academic science journals in the world are, and they're going to name the ones that I'm discussing here with you today. <laughs> okay? This is, I'm going to read to you right now the journal Nature. Okay? There's a journal called Nature, and there's a journal called Science. Those are the two most, considered the two most prestigious overall academic science journals in the world. And I'm going to read you part of, I'm going to read you the, part of the abstract of one right now. Let me just read, okay, this is, this is the journal Nature, number 454, pages 362 to 363, uh, March 18, 2010, but put online March 17, 2010. This is by a fellow named Ian Affleck, who teaches apparently in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of British Columbia. Listen to the title of this article. Solid state physics. Golden ratio seen in magnet. Okay? <laughs> okay, so let's go through this other this Science Daily article. Uh, ScienceDaily.com. This was released on January 7, 2010. Title of the article, Golden Ratio Discovered in Quantum World. Hidden Symmetry Observed for the First Time in Solid State Matter. <laughs> let's find out what that first time, what that means. Let's, let's read here. Researchers from Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin, uh, and it's, it's some German words, uh, in cooperation with colleagues from Oxford and Bristol universities, as well as the Rutherford App Appleton Laboratory, United Kingdom, have for the first time observed a nanoscale symmetry hidden in solid state matter. Okay, <laughs> did you catch that? This is the first time any symmetry of any sort has been observed in the nano scale, okay, the, the quantum scale. Remember, quantum physics is the study of the base level energies of nature. Okay, the smallest building blocks that make up everything, little pieces of energy, like the electron or the muon or the quark. Okay, so specifically, what was found in uh, this study was that chains of atoms lined up together form uh, what's sort of like a string, and it resonates a frequency or pitch. <laughs> what do you know? The pitch is in the ratio of 1.618, the golden ratio. Let me just read this paragraph to you. This is Science Daily, again, January 7, 2010, Golden Ratio Discovered in Quantum World. By turning the system and artificially introducing more quantum uncertainty, the researchers observed that the chains of atoms acts like a nanotech guitar string. Dr. Rel Radu Koldia from Oxford University who is the principal author of the paper and drove the international project from its inception a decade ago until the present explains here the tension comes from the interaction between spins causing them to magnetically resonate for these interactions we found a series scale of resonant notes the first two notes show a perfect relationship with each other their frequencies pitch are in the ratio of 1.618 <laughs> This is just amazing. There's no defense that a random universe theorist in academia can give to counter this. They, there's no reason at all that the quantum base of reality should be exhibiting the, golden, the specific number of the golden ratio if we live in a random universe. All the competing theories, evolution, random universe theories, all the junk from academia no longer competes in any way with intelligent design science, intelligent design theory. When you hear a scientist say on the Discovery Channel or something, an academic, a professional, say, 
There's no evidence for intelligent design. It's all a silly little parlor game. And there's all this evidence for evolutionary science and the academic theories for the origins of the universe. You can know two things. One, we have to be compassionate because they simply don't know the empirical data. Okay? They have no idea. They only, academics typically only talk on their closed little worlds and only accept information from their closed little worlds. And the second thing we can know, and make no mistake about it, is they are absolutely propagandizing the world with all of their thesis, theses about the nature of the universe that we live in, where we come from, our origins, the origin of the universe, and so forth. And we realize that everything we've been taught before this point by the professionals were lies. And we can prove it up and down all over the place. Up and down all over the place. Up. Can matter organize itself? No. Today there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. The information that is stored in, in the DNA molecule is pointing back to, an, to a designing intelligence. Now why do I say that? Um, it has to do with what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. Uh, our, our local hero in Seattle, uh, Bill Gates, says the DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever created. And that's a very suggestive remark because we know that programs always come from programmers. And in fact, we know generally that information, whether it's in a computer program or a hieroglyphic inscription or in a headline in a newspaper or uh, a block of text in a book, Information always comes from an intelligent source. So yes. when we find information in the DNA molecule, the most logical thing to conclude is that it too had an intelligent source. An intelligent source. An intelligent source. As far as I'm concerned, I'm here to tell you, Michael, this morning and Jason, evolution is dead. Long live the Creator. I'll tell you why. And I'm saying science says that as a scientist. Uh, evolution is dead because there's such thing as the minimal gene set concept. They've taken a mycoplasma, smallest organism, mycoplasma genitalium, which is the smallest organism that is known to exist, has 468 genes. A gene is a mix of uh, proteins, right? Mm -hmm. a, a list of, so it can be 1,000, can be 10,000 amino acids. Okay, they're 486, and they've decided since year 2000, they've said, let's take them, let's try to reduce it. Because we have to start, if you're going to be an evolutionist, you have to start with zero genes and build up if you're going to go from hydrogen to human. And so... Somewhere along the way, they said, well, let's take it down. In the year 2000, they published that even on paper, they couldn't go below uh, 200 genes. In, on the 6th of January 2006, in Nature, they published that in reality, you could only go down to 397 genes. So, so, so a cell, which is where my specialty lies in my, my uh, scientific work, a cell needs a specific number of components to be functional. You have a membrane, but then you need to feed the membrane. So you have to have some mitochondria. You need a way of tagging the proteins. You need some DNA. So you need... 397 things, just the glucose cycle for getting en energy takes over six different genes. So if you don't have one of them, you don't have any more energy coming to the cell. Is new information being generated? That's what evolutionists have to come up with. Right. They have to have a mechanism that generates new, never before existing genetic information right. that can build all these bigger and better structures. Right. That, uh, that supposedly never existed before. Right. Right. Never before existing information. In, in, back when, the, when there was only a single cell that gave rise to all the diversity of life, there wasn't information right. for skin and hair and heart and a brain and so on. Right. So you have to generate it somehow, according to evolution. Right. Now, Dr. Werner Gitt is an information specialist. Since we're talking about information, mm -hmm. we'll go to an information specialist. Okay. He wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information that you and I both, uh, both love. Mm -hmm. um, and in his book, he says this, a code system is always the result of a mental process. It requires an intelligent origin or inventor. Mm -hmm. It should be emphasized that matter as such is unable to 
to generate any code. All experiences indicate that a thinking being voluntarily exercising his own free will, cognition, and creativity is required. Right. He goes on to say, there is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Right. This is why Professor Richard Dawkins, one of the most renowned advocates of the theory of evolution of our day, hesitates when he is asked to give a single example that increases the genetic information. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Richard Dawkins is his name. Uh, arguably the world's most famous atheist. I don't know how you would test for that, but uh, maybe we'll ask him. So, uh, right off the bat, what's wrong with, in your opinion, with believing in a god, regardless of who the god is? I think it's false. Uh, I think that it's um, a matter of belief without evidence. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. We're reporting on cutting-edge research by Chinese scientist J.Y. Chen, an internationally respected paleontologist at the Nanjing Institute of Paleontology and Geology. Chin's discoveries in the fossil beds in Xinjiang, China, have rocked the scientific establishment. Located in the province of Yunnan in southern China, Xinjiang has some of the world's best preserved fossils from the Cambrian era. Darwinism helps them maybe only telling a part story for evolution. According to Chen, the fossils he's discovered turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. Darwin is a tree, you know, uh, reverse conscious, very unexpectedly. Our research is convincing uh, major phyla starting down below at the beginning of Cambrian. Base is white, gradually narrow, so this is almost uh, turned on different way. This situation refutes the theory of evolution for sure, because Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species, if numerous species belonging to the same genera or families have really started into life all at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of descent with slow modification through natural selection. This fatal stroke that frightened Darwin comes from the Cambrian period, right at the outset of the fossil record.